Now, Um, good evening, everybody. Just to welcome everybody to the Spring Slim Down webinar by Spillers, just to check that everybody's in the right place and weren't expecting some kind of piano lesson or tap dancing, because that's not what I'm going to be offering. Um, we will start in at 8 o'clock sharp, so we've got two minutes. Um, but just a reminder for those that are on already, if you can please uh, make sure that you put yourselves on to mute. Um, and um, if you're having problems with connections, turning your video off can help. Um, and we will be starting in two minutes.
So it's eight o'clock. Um, I will say good evening to everybody. My name's Isabel from Spillers. Um, tonight we're going to be covering spring slim down. So the feeding tips for our overweight or prone to overweight horses. Hopefully they're all looking a little bit slimmer at the moment as we come towards the end of the winter. Um, I do need to let everybody know we are recording this evening's webinar um, and it will be available um, after and be sent out to everybody after this evening. Um, so if you do miss anything, please um, don't be afraid that it will be sent out to you. I do have my colleague Bella who is um, on with us this evening. She will be manning the chat box. I don't know if you want to give everybody a wave Bella, I did a wave. You. Hello, everyone. thank you. I can't see you, so that's perfect. <laughs> oh, thank <hi>. you. <laughs> um, so she'll be manning the chat for us. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free um, to use the chat box, um, and we will also open up um, the microphones to everybody at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, just again, a reminder for anybody joining a bit later: this recording, this webinar is being recorded. Um, just quickly. We this uh, webinar is available for those registered with AMTRA for CPD points. We don't have anybody registered for this as to to date, um, but if you are wanting to gain some AMTRA C CPD points, sorry, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, please put your name, your full name, and your AMTRA registration into the chat and your um, email address so that we can make sure that the email with the online quiz gets sent out to you within 24 hours. The link is only alive for 24 hours, and so you would need to complete it in that time to be able to get your AMTRA points. Um, and if anybody's Sorry, go, no, Bella. We, we do actually already have two people that have put their names and AMTRA numbers in the okay. chat. And more okay. people have. So I'm worrying that the tag isn't working. So if you are doing it, thank you. Please add your emails if you haven't already done so, and I will go through the chat. Lots of people. OK. <laughs> We've had some issues uh, with the um, registering the emails address. So that's why yeah. we had nobody registered. So um, just to make sure, can you please make sure you put your email addresses in? So um, that I can follow up. So that we can in follow fact, up. In fact, I'm going to give you my email address and you can all email me in case you don't receive it, in case I miss anyone. I'm going to put this in here and I'll do it again at the end, just in case you don't oh, receive perfect. the well, link. I, I will just go through this um, through this uh, this slide then. So we do need your full name. Um, so are, you can either put that in the chat, that's, uh, Bella's manning that, so I'm sure she's happy to take those from that, or log in with your full name. The You'll get an email straight after the webinar has ended, which has a, a link to an online quiz. You need to receive a score of 8 out of 10 to gain your CPD points. The link is only live for 24 hours, and you need to supply your AMTRA registration number. The questions are not multiple choice. So those who are AMTRA, um, SQPs and uh, what would you say, RAMAs or R RAMAs? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. <coughs> Check your email straight after the webinar has ended and you'll receive that link to an online quiz. It will only be live for 24 hours and you need to supply your AMTRA number and the questions are not multiple choice. I will, rem if if I forget, Bella, just remind me to cover this again at the end. Just I'm just thinking case. I can also put the quiz link straight in the chat here as well as another oh, way perfect. to make sure people have got it. Excellent. Um, Brilliant. I don't know if I'm allowed to do it at the beginning because people could fill it in as they go. Yeah. But I think they have to do it at the end. Have so I'll put it end. in here at the end. And in the meantime, I'll put my email address just in case anyone misses it. They can follow up with me directly. I'm really sorry that this hasn't been as seamless as in, in the past, everyone. <laughs> it's the last one of the series. And we managed <laughs> to not get it right. <laughs> well, and, and to add to the fun this evening, um, we are going to have quite an interactive um presentation and I have tried to be clever this evening and add some polls, live polls for people. So it could add to the fun of the evening if the polls don't work how I'm planning. Um, so Bella's probably looking extremely scared now because we've not tried this before. I thought <laughs> last one of the season, let's try it, but let's crack on. Um, as I say, just for those people that are joining us late, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, my name's Isabel. I'm one of the uh, nutritional advisors at Spillers, probably been around a long time. So some of you may even have met me. Um, and uh, this is the last of the series of webinars for this winter on the Spillers Slim Down, managing our overweight or prone to overweight horses. Um, those of you that have joined our previous webinars will have seen this slide before, but it is really important that we just really reiterate the science behind 
Spillers behind our brand because it is something that's unique to the Spillers brand and it's provided to us by the Waltham Equine Studies Group, which is a collaboration of researchers around the world. Um, and it's headed up by our Dr. Pat Harris, who has worked with these key institutes for well over 20 years um, and, it, and it still remains at the forefront of all equine nutritional science. A lot of the research and papers is comes from that's done even shared by other other companies is done by um, and supported by Waltham. So we have three key areas um, within our equine studies group, obesity, laminitis and the senior horse. And I think that's something that everybody who has horses probably has a keen interest in one of those three areas. So some of there's some there's been a huge amount of um, obesity research and there's some highlights um, that well we think they're highlights anyway. One of them is to is that we've sort of got some commonly recommended methods for monitoring condition or, or, or weight of the horse. So we've got a cresty neck score, belly girth, rump width and width measurements. I will share a bit more about those later on. We've got evidence to support the body condition scoring system of um, one to nine, with seven out of nine being considered obese. And that's now a globally accepted definition. And that's why it's really important that we encourage people to use the one to nine system. Um, we were the first study to evaluate the effect of strip grazing on body weight. That seems, uh, I whenever I say this, it actually seems quite crazy to me that we've all used strip grazing. I've, I've been around horses, dare I say, for near on 40 years and strip grazing has been around for as long as that. And yet the, we were the first people to do a study to actually evaluate the effectiveness of it. We've done a series of studies evaluating the effect of grazing muzzles on pasture intake and body weight. Something else that another area that surprises me, given that we don't we don't sell grazing muzzles, we don't make them. Um, but again, we have done a series of studies to evaluate the effect. And this just really demonstrates that, it, that our research is not just about um, feed. It's about helping um, our in, in, the, in the, the sort of Mars pet care terms, our pet parents because our horses we see us our horses as our children um in most cases and so we are horse parents um we've also shown that some horses and ponies may be weight loss resistant and we've also shown that the a real severe calorie restriction may affect the rate of future weight gain and also most recently we've shown that some weight loss resistant ponies so ponies that struggle to lose weight their gut microflora or may be involved um in the fibre digestion. So they may be able to change, adapt themselves to counteract that restricted diet. So that's why we might have these ponies that no matter what we do, struggle to lose weight. Somebody, if they could just have a look at their, why is it, um, their mute button, that would be great. Right, so this is my first little attempt at launching a poll. If this doesn't work, I'm gonna be asking you, I think Bella's got her hand up. I'm going to mute everyone, but then you'll have to unmute yourself. OK, OK, thanks, Bella. Can you still hear me? Wonderful. So this is going to be my first attempt at launching my poll. Um, and so what I want us to do, and if this doesn't work, we'll put the questions in the chat. So there are many risks about of obesity or being overweight. I've listed three there, which are probably commonplace to us, but there are more. So if I launch my poll, I am hoping that you may be able to then see in your presentation, wherever it is, um, and a, a, a word cloud. I can see it. OK, um, that you can pop in what you believe to be the risks of obesity. Can you still see it? Yep. I can't, which is interesting. Oh, don't know how that works. Maybe you could read them out to me, Bella. Well, at the moment, I can only see yours, mine, which I'm assuming I've got it right, but who knows? <laughs> uh... I'm just putting everyone's email addresses in at the moment. <laughs> okay. Well, 
Um, if anybody else can't see the poll, maybe just pop it in the chat for me. I don't want to keep using this. Um, oh, I've got I've got one response. Maybe nobody else can see it. Don't know. OK, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to waste time on that because ultimately um, you, you're here to listen. Um, but. At least I know it worked for Bella. If anybody wants to add anything to the chat, that's great. We might try another one later on. So here's our list. Laminitis, obviously. Insulin dysregulation often linked to laminitis or equine metabolic syndrome. Syndrome People may think of it as joint strain. You know, the pressure that's put onto a horse's uh, joints is, is immense when they're overweight. I often, practically when I'm speaking to people and I see a horse that's maybe 60 to 100 kilos overweight, I'll often say to them, you know, that's like them carrying two riders. And would you expect them to do that all the time? So it's really important to think about that. Heat intolerance problems, so they struggle to maintain their, their body temperature. Inflama, inflama, I can't say, inflama aging. This is about it, uh, an inflammation response. Um, and so the um, uh, obesity causing them to um, have an inflammatory response. Um, by being overweight. Some forms of colic, so linked to um, fatty, uh, uh, what they call um, lipomas, which are fatty lumps in the digestive system. Reproductional issues, horses not being able to get into foal or hold the foal. Lack of energy, poor performance, that's probably the biggest question we receive on our care line and on our yard visits every day. Um, and respiratory stress, struggling to do the work that we're being asked of them because they're carrying too much weight. So how do we monitor our bodies, our horses' weight and condition? As I said at the start, we've done various studies to look at this, but there are the most practical method that's available to us is body condition scoring. Now, we advocate the use of the one to nine body condition scoring scale, um, which involves you looking at six different areas of the horse's body, scoring each of those areas on the scale of one to nine by feel, by how much fat you can feel and then averaging it out. Now, I'm not going to go into it because body condition scoring itself could be a whole topic, um, but <coughs> sorry, a whole presentation. But there is a really good link to our website, which Bella might helpfully put in the chat. She's usually quite good at doing these things um, to how to body condition score and the videos of how to do so. Um, and then that is something that you could get used to doing yourself. It seems a little bit perhaps um, over the top, but I suggest to people, you know, when you're just brushing your horse, just turn your, your mind to just having a bit of a prod and a poke in those key areas, because then you'll get used to what it feels like for your horse, what fat feels like in those areas. We then have the body condition indexing. Now this is a more um, perhaps objective measurement of body condition and weight and fat because it involves measuring certain key areas of the horse's body as seen on the diagram um, on the slide. So you can see you measure their neck at the widest part, their heart girth, that's the same as where you would put a weight tape, their belly girth, which is the widest part of their belly, and their length and also their height. With all of those numbers, you chuck them into a calculator that again is on our website and it throws out a number for you, which helps you a similar, I guess, to a number that you would see on a, a BMI for humans. Um, and, it, and it again indicates to you whether your horse is overweight, an appropriate weight or underweight. Weight tapes are really useful and a practical tool for us all on our yards. The problem with a weight tape is they're only measuring one area. So they're only measuring that heart girth area. And sadly, it's the, it's the area that seems to change the least. So when you are measuring your horse, it can be get really despondent because you think to yourself your horse is losing weight, but actually that weight tape doesn't change. Um, so what I suggest to people is, you know, even if you don't use the body condition indexing as a whole, maybe get used to taking measurements in those key areas and, and storing those measurements in your phone. That way, if the neck changes, particularly if you have a horse that's questy, for example, if the neck changes quicker, it will give you more of an indication. I, I guess a bit like a person might take bust, waist and hips measurements and they might change depending on the person. Um, in horses, we can do the same kind of thing. 
Wave tapes, we do have to be really cautious about when we are using them as a monitoring tool and they can be useful. Make sure that we use the same wave tape. That sounds obvious, but um, there are many different wave tapes and they will all say different numbers. Make sure you use it at the same time of day. So if you've got a horse that's live that's out in the field during the day and you bring them in at night, their wave tape reading when they come in from the field to when they go out in the morning may be very different. So make sure you use it at the same time of day um, and make sure the same person uses it because we'll all put a little bit different amounts of tension on it depending on how we're feeling that day. The Weighbridge is obviously um, your gold standard in telling you how much your horse actually weighs, but that may not tell you whether your horse is overweight. Often, because we're so used to measuring ourselves on scales, we think the same is appropriate for horses. But unless you are, have the ability to have regular weigh-ins, whether your horse changes by 20, 30 kilo or 30 kilos may not be an indication of how much fat they're losing or putting on. It might be an indication of how much water they're carrying or not carrying, depending on their work. Um, my lovely colleague Bella is well into endurance and she knows that, you know, when our horses have done a big distance ride, they could be 20 or 30 kilos lighter just by their hydration status, not by how much fat they've lost during that ride. So it's important to be aware that the Weighbridge is your gold standard to give you a weight, but it may not tell you whether your horse is fat, thin or a perfect weight. The body condition score is better for that. So, oh, I've got the link in there. I forgot I had that. Sorry, Bella. Um, so how to monitor body condition score, as I say, we have a link to it on our website. We're aiming for a body condition score of four and a half to five and a half out of nine. As I said on previous slides, anything uh, globally above a seven, seven and above is considered to be obese. Below a four, um, as I say, a four I would be comfortable with at this time of year, particularly if it's a horse that I know gains weight in the wind, uh, in the summer, um, below a four is considered to be too thin. So using the weigh tape weekly, again, is really useful as long as we follow the rules that I mentioned. And then, as I said about the other key areas that we can measure, one of them is the belly girth. So using your tape measure around the belly girth. One word of warning on the belly girth is if you have a big horse, anything over I know, 16 hands, I guess, a normal um, tape measure or even a weight tape won't be long enough. So you have to get a seamstress's tape measure, which is even which is a long one. Um, to make it work don't make my mistake and try and use a um like a carpenter's tape measure that's metal because they don't really like it very much um so and it doesn't bend around their bellies very well so you know a, a, a seamstress's tape measure is one of your best options the rump girth can be measured like this this is a really good indicator on the side here this poor horse hasn't got a tail um but it's a really good way of having a look to see whether they're losing their fat over their rump, which is an area where a lot of horses who have um, weight challenges carry their fat. So the first thing when we're talking about diet is that suitable forage, and I highlight the word suitable, should be the foundation of the diet of any horse, not just good doers, but race horses, performance horses, every horse. But it's about the suitability of that forage. So the real watch out here is that not all forage is the same. What you choose, grass, hay, haylage, straw, or even a hay replacer, which is best will be dependent on your management, your horse and your situation. Looks can be really deceptive. Um, you can't tell by looking at your hay or haylage, whether it's high calorie, high sugar or vice versa. When we're really managing horses that are struggling with their body weight and we've done everything we can, we maybe need to consider forage analysis. That has its own challenges and again is a whole presentation in itself, um, but it can be useful to give us a starting point as to what calories are going into our horse from our forage. We might need to consider restricted or even zero grazing, but we can talk about, we'll talk about that in later slides. If nothing else, Remember from tonight's presentation, forage is the largest source of calories in your horse's diet. So how much grass do horses eat? Ponies may consume up to 5% of their body weight if they're living out 24 seven. 
But what does that really mean? A 12 and a half kilos of food is what a 250 kilo pony, 12 two pony, could consume. There's enough calories in that to fuel a 500 kilo racehorse. So free access to spring grass far exceeds the published energy requirement for horses and ponies in light work, even when their grass looks bare. So often when we go to a yard or receive a call, owners will say to us, but there's no grass out there. Fundamentally, if your horse is out in a field and he's gaining weight or not losing weight, he or she is eating more calories than they need. So how do we restrict that grass intake? Well, I've already mentioned the fact that we've done studies on strip grazing and we have found that stripped grazed ponies are seen to gain less weight than ponies with free, free it's a bit of a mouthful, free access to restricted pasture. There is a watch out with this because every situation is unique and the study that we did was managed meticulously. So we need to consider when we are using strip grazing whether or not the size of the field to begin with, how many horses are on that field, what the weather's doing, how quickly the grass is growing. But fundamentally, strip grazing can be useful. We've just published a more recent study which further evaluated that role of strip grazing and found that it delivered a steady, a steadier nutrient supply to horses compared to given free access to restricted grazing. And so that's really interesting because it might mean that they don't sort of do that gorging um, that, and then starvation, if you like, that would happen otherwise. Um, so there's still more work to do around strip grazing. And we still, as I say, <coughs> it's not a case of just putting a fence across and then moving it X amount per day. You do need to, co to consider whether or not a back fence is suitable for your horse or not. In the studies that we did, it didn't matter whether a back fence was implemented or not. But I go back to the fact that these horses were already put on a managed uh, amount of grazing or pasture. So if you want some more information about those studies, these can all be found um, on our website under our uh, science and blog sections. So how important is sugar and starch? Because we can't live without sugar. Our brains require glucose to function. So we can't have a sugar free diet. It's impossible for humans and for horses. But there are so many terms and loads of confusion around sugar and starch. Fundamentally, we are looking at water soluble carbohydrates when we are talking about forage. So this is mainly simple sugars and fructans. Fructans are the storage form of sugar in grass, which is why you might hear about, especially if we're talking about laminitis, for example, you might hear about the fructans being higher um, in um, frosty grass. NSC is another term you, <coughs> excuse me, you might hear. Now, this is starch plus WSC. There isn't much starch in forage, so we don't consider that when we're looking at grass and hay. Um, starch predominantly comes from cereals. Grass can be up to 15% simple sugars and 35% WSC on a dry matter basis. Don't worry too much about that. The, pro the, 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 the point I'm getting across here is that grass can be very high in sugar compared to a horse feed that may only be let's say 5% sugar um, on a dry matter basis. So the point here is most of the sugar in a horse's diet, the biggest source of sugar um, in a horse's diet is gonna come from forage, be it grass or haylage. Of course though, if we do have a horse uh, at risk from laminitis, we do need to consider high sugar and starch. I haven't focused on um, laminitis in this presentation. So if we are just talking about weight loss, yes, we want to restrict sugar because obviously it is high in calories, but it's not the biggest concern for us. It's calories in versus calories out. So I've got my next poll here, which again may not work. So please, is it come up, Bella, or? It's coming up in the chat, but it only works for people that are signed into Teams. 
So oh, those people can okay. um, maybe leave a comment. Yes, yes. Okay, so if you just leave a comment if it doesn't come up. So um, this is just a little bit of a, a bit of a test, if you like, a little bit of a challenge. How much starch and sugar provided by any, I can't talk this evening, it's been a long day, sorry, provided by any feed will depend on how much of it's eaten. So in practice, we've got three different scenarios here. A five kilo hainet, which has about 15% sugar content. 24 7 grazing and 250 grams of balancer have a little bit of a guess as to how much sugar or if you've got the poll the ranking of it which one's highest um, and then on my next slide i'll share with you how right you all are i'll just give you a few seconds Is, are people entering um i haven't got the poll oh not working i think i need more practice people are putting their comments though can you see all the chat not yet but i will what try. people are saying is highest i think one person said feed but uh, everyone else at the moment is saying the grip well, no someone else has said balance up and everyone else is saying the grass slash grazing okay no one's voted for hey well that's good <laughs> i can see them now well people are you using them all in the, in the chat oh i can't even i can't see the poll now i've got 10 responses in it how bizarre is that <laughs> i think i need more practice on using polls okay but i say the majority of people are voting for grass with the odd person voting for balancer Excellent. Right. Well, you'll be pleased to know you're all correct. We could have as much as nearly two kilos of sugar from that grass. That's a huge amount of sugar. 637 grams of sugar from the hay net. And only 12 grams of sugar from the balancer, 250 grams of balancer. So you can see Worrying around the sh what sugar percentage your balancer is, is really insignificant when we have absolutely no idea how much your horse may be getting from their grass or even their hay net. So going back to how we restrict that grass intake, well, grazing muzzles have really risen. And again, we've done some studies on it, as you saw, and they're shown to reduce grass intake by around 80 percent, regardless of the season. So they are a really useful method of restricting um, calorie intake, grass intake. Obviously, there are some watch outs. Don't live on 24 seven. There are, I, I'm very well aware that there are some people that do have to do so, um, but as a recommendation from us, it's not something we would we would suggest because um, horses need some time to be able to mutually groom themselves or groom themselves or mutually groom others. Um, and so we would always say that they should be really only worn for eight to 12 hours. When we do take them off, we need to consider stabling or non-grass turnout because what will happen when we take them off is we're off with we have the risk of binge eating um so we need to introduce gradually people always i often get told oh no my horse won't wear a grazing muzzle no no he, he i've tried it he didn't like it again we have to remember how did we introduce that muzzle to the horse because i can bet your bottom dollar if you asked a pony or a horse would you prefer to be stood in your stable for 24 hours a day or go out with this little thing on your face that allows you to get a little bit of grass as all day, they would prefer the latter because horses like to browse and they like to take small amounts of food in continuously. Um, so it's all about introduction. There are different muzzles out there. What works for one horse might not work for the other. So take that into account. I know it's not easy because you can spend an awful lot of money money on one muzzle and then the horse not like it and want a, and you want to buy another one. Um, I do always wonder whether somebody at some point will come out with a, a muzzle bank, a bit like the bit bank, where you can try different ones. I think the downside of that is they, they get worn out easily, unlike a bit. So, um, but, you know, on your yard, perhaps ask to borrow somebody's, try different ones. If one's not working for your horse, don't give up. 
of course check your horse or pony is happy to to drink and to eat check the grass is not too long um or too short you want to be able to uh, you need a little bit of grass to be able to be accessed through the base of the muzzle regard uh, depending on um its design it will be different for each muzzle in each horse of course monitor their weight and body condition regularly and make sure that your dentist or your vet whoever's doing your dental checkup is aware that you're using a muzzle so that they can pay extra attention to their teeth in that respect look for signs of rubbing or discomfort check the muzzle for signs of wear and tear you don't want anything getting caught if it's if it's broken in one side <coughs> monitor the behavior for signs of distress and, and look out for bullying a horse can't um a lot of the way that horses will uh, get uh, monitor their higher dynamics is by using facial um, cues and with a muzzle on it's more difficult for them to do that um, and certainly usually the first point of defense is, is ears back teeth bared they can't do that with a muscle on so look out for those signs of bullying i mentioned binge eating but it is important because grass turn out for shorter periods and then um, can be counterproductive. So in just three hours in one of the studies that we um, that we implemented, ponies consumed up to 1% of their body weight in just three hours when turned out without a muzzle on. So it might be better to consider longer turnout with a muzzle than shorter turnout and then stood into a stable um, for longer periods of time. Again, a lot of these ideas and management strategies will depend on your individual situation how you keep your horses and your horse as to what's the right way to manage your pony or horse individually people often talk about overnight turnout and it is worth considering when the sugar levels the wsc levels may be lower the problem with this is that if you turn them out overnight the chances are they're out for longer so even though the WSC is lower, they may well be consuming more than they do during the day because of the sheer hours that they're out. But for some people, this sort of management strategy turning out at night is really effective. So again, it's individual um, and should be considered something that you can you can try um, if you're struggling and your horse is out for a few hours during the day. So when we go back to choosing the right for, right forage, it's not as simple as just saying haylage is higher in calories than hay. Straw, hay replaces, they're all good options. I put this table in here because not because you, you need to remember the, the numbers, but I really wanted to show you from a, a table that with hay and haylage, the energy level can be very similar. So where people are frightened of using haylage for good doers, it isn't often necessary. There are things we need to consider with haylage. For example, it can be more palatable and eaten quicker. But from an energy calorie point of view, it is not much different to hay. Also, haylage tends to have a lower sugar content because the fermentation process of haylage, so that making of haylage, that storage, that preservation, fermentation, actually uses sugar. So in many cases, when analysed, haylage will have a lower sugar level, which is often what gives us the lower energy levels. Grass, as you would expect, um, has a much higher energy level, calorie level. <coughs> these, these figures are on a dry meta basis. Um, straw, lower, so it can be a really useful source of fibre to our horses, but I'll touch on that later. And hay replaces, not dissimilar to hay, but can be useful for us when we're choosing our right forage because they give us a known calorie content. So how can we reduce our calorie intake from forage? Again, we want to look at different strategies and I'm going to go through those over the next couple of slides. We could consider replacing up to 30, well, up to 50% of the forage ration with straw. We can use any straw, wheat straw, um, oat straw, but we must introduce it really gradually. Some of the research, like? some of the re research has shown that um, straw, 
that horses have to adapt to chewing straw in a different way because it's more lignified, more stalky. So we must introduce it gradually, but it is very safe to feed up to 50% of the ration. And it can be a great way of making sure that our horses aren't stood for long periods of time with nothing to eat, but they have got a lower calorie version uh, um, of, of the forage. You can also steam straw. So if we're worried about the hygienic quality, we can look at steaming the straw. We can consider using a low calorie partial hay replacer, which has a controlled calorie content. Now, this can be really useful. I mean, obviously, we, we all know feeding something like Happy Hoof as a partial hay replacer is a bit yummy for those horses and ponies, and they're going to eat it quite quickly. But what it does do is a little bit like us buying a, a Slimming World meal. It gives us a calorie controlled portion of their diet which if we haven't been able to analyze our forage and we don't know and they are spending time out of grass and we don't know what calorie provision was, was coming from this big part of their diet using something like happy hoof or any other hay replacer partially to replace some of that forage can give us a known calorie content and a known sugar and starch content so it can be really useful in helping us to manage their diets Hay soaking is something that we all talk about at this time of year. It's not easy, um, but it does help to reduce the WSC. The results, unfortunately, are really variable. So soaking alone, if we're talking about laminitics, is not a guarantee. But because this presentation is about reducing calories, soaking can be really useful because it can reduce the WSC by up to 40%. When we do start talking about laminitics, we're looking at forage analysis. As I said before, UK forage contains very little starch. So if we are doing a forage analysis, we want to make sure we're testing it for WSC, not NSC. And just in case anybody is interested in forage analysis, what I suggest is you ask a question at the end. But what I would say is make sure you do your research as to the appropriate analysis required, particularly if you're looking at WSC. There are different methods and wet chemistry is really the only way we can accurately measure WSC in our forage. But again, uh, if you have a specific question on forage analysis, we can deal with that at the end. Often people are asking, how long do we soak it for in the warm weather, in the cold weather? <coughs> this is an area that has been researched and continues to be researched because the results are so variable. But our guidelines are six to 12 hours in cold weather and one to three hours in warm weather. So that's outside temperatures of 16 and above. And that's because as it gets warmer, that soaking of that hay can start, the water starts to ferment and it can one, make the hay unpalatable and it can encourage the, the growth of molds, et cetera. So I suppose the next question is, well, can I steam it? what's the difference between soaking and steaming? From a hygiene point of view, research has shown steaming is by far the best option and re reduces the number of um, dust particles, resp respirable particles that the horse can inhale and microbial contamination. However, it's not very effective at reducing WSC. This isn't practical, but gold standard would be soaking to reduce the WSC followed by steaming. So that in effect produces the best of both worlds. It reduces the sugar content and improves the hygienic quality. I really, I do understand as a horse owner of two, it's that, that isn't easy, but it is a gold standard way of managing them. Um, homemade steamers are not recommended. Unfortunately, they do not get hot enough um, and the temperatures don't reach that required to um, help reduce that microbial contamination and in fact can encourage growth of microbes. So how much forage should you feed or should I feed? Well, there's a technical answer here and then there's also what we would suggest from a practical point of view. And the reason I always include the technical answer is because you'll hear this number, 1.5% of current body weight banded about vets will come out and say to you, you need to reduce their diet to 1.5% of their current body weight. The problem with that is that uh, percentage was calculated based on a dry matter basis. 
So, and everything that we feed has some water in it. So we actually really need to think about the as fed basis, the way in, we, in which we feed it. That one and a half percent of current body weight on a dry meta basis would be seven and a half kilos a day, but that would include grass. It's not that much. But what, what does, as I say, dry matter is something that we need to be aware of, particularly when we're restricting horses to this extent. When we're feeding ad lib, it's not so much of a concern. So as I said, all forage, even dry hay, contains some water, which doesn't count towards their fibre intake. So if we take that seven and a half kilos as we as fed, the amount we weigh out, six and a half to seven kilos of it is hay and 500 grams to a kilo is water. So that if we've got these horses on restriction, i.e. no grass and only on hay, we could be restricting them by a kilo below what they require to maintain their health. Practically, sorry, I've just gone back because I've realised I, I don't mention a, a practical application here, which I think is really important. Because unless you've had your forage analysed, you're not going to know how much water it contains. As a guide, we would always say, calculate your horse's forage requirement based on 1.8% of their body current body weight. That way, you are taking into account the water content of the hay that you're feeding. If you're feeding haylage, that would need to be increased. But as a practical guide in a horse that's getting no, well, even if they're getting grass, work it out on 1.8% of their current body weight to help you with their, um, uh, their, their sort of um, diet regime as a minimum. We've talked about soaking hay, but the thing that we are starting to again realise with these restrictions is once we soak our hay, it will contain less hay and more water than we started with. So we actually do, again, if we're soaking our hay, need to increase the amount that we're feeding. Again, remember, if your horse is getting some turnout, you have absolutely no idea how much they're eating in the grass. So this is this is quite a um, an academic measurement, if you like, that's really important when we've got horses on severe and strict uh, regimes. But if they're out at grass, <coughs> and you're not doing this, don't panic. So we should, if we're soaking for over an hour, increase the amount of hay we are soaking by 20%, unless we're feeding ad lib, back to what I was saying about, unless they're getting access to grass, um, which we're not restricting. So what does this mean in practice? So a five, so again, you can see here, my, dem, my example here is a horse with no grazing, because this is where it becomes really important. So a 500 kilo horse with no grazing would need nine kilos of hay if fed dry. But if we soak it, that amount, and it's got no grazing, should be increased to 11 kilos. That's the unsoaked weight. So we should be weighing out 11 kilos before we feed it. Now, I appreciate some of these numbers are all a bit mind blowing, and that's where um, the Spillers Nutritional Advisors are there to help you put together diet regimes if your horse is on really restricted rations. So how do we manage safe weight loss? Well, we're aiming for around 0.5 to 1% of body weight loss per week. That's around two and a half to five kilos for a 500 kilo horse. That's after the first week. In the first week, we might notice, just like humans, um, a much greater reduction, a much greater weight loss. And that's, that's completely normal and that's fine, but it will slow down. So we want to aim for around 0.5 to 1% of body weight per week. Well, how are we going to monitor that? Body condition scoring, weigh tapes, weigh bridges, if you have one, that will help you monitor their weight loss. But because so many of our horses go out to grass, we don't know how much they're 
eating when they're out there, even on poor pasture. So one way we can practically manage that grass intake or the forage intake um, is to count your droppings. So we look with their droppings if to, to know how many they do on a normal basis. When we start to implement our restrictions, we aim to reduce that by a third initially, um, if, if we're wanting our horse to, lo to lose weight, and never by more than a half. So if they if they're dropping if the number of droppings they do reduce by more than a half, we know we're restricting them too much. So it, it again it might seem a little bit um, OTT to go out there and count your horses' droppings, but it can be a really useful way of monitoring their forage intake, especially if you don't have access to a weigh tape um, or a, an accurate way of, of weighing them. This is a, a subject that comes up so much to rug or not to rug. So the thermo neutral zone. So this is the, the temperatures of which a horse can manage their own body temperature. In, for horses in mild climates, really, that's the climate we're living in today. And those are who aren't clipped, because obviously once we take off their natural coat, we, we interfere with this, but is around between five and 25 degrees C. There really hasn't been many days this year and last year, given that we're in 2024 and February, um, where temperatures have dropped below five for long periods of time. I know that last night my the temperatures in my my area were around one degree, but it wasn't for very long and they went up during the day. So that's to say that if your horse isn't clipped, actually, do we need to be putting rugs on them? with the mild temperatures that we're experiencing. Again, I say this with caution because there are various reasons why horses may still require rugs and they're not clipped, and that might be age. An elderly horse may need a bit more support. The really wet weather that we've had, even though the temperatures are not that low, really play, takes toll on some horses. My horse came in the other day and I'd been mean on him and his rug had leaked and he was shivering. Um, and he's not clipped and he's carrying enough fat that he doesn't really need to wear a rug. But because the rug had leaked and was against his skin, that had had an impact on him. But it is important to avoid over rugging, um, especially with our good doers, because we want them to burn more calories. And if we don't, if we if we um, avoid over rugging them, we can make them work harder to keep warm. Of course, we need to take them off regularly to assess their weight. It can be very easy with a horse with a rug on, especially one living out or turned away, to one, for them to lose more weight than we realise, but secondly, for them to not lose any weight. And we suddenly get to February and we think, gosh, spring is around the corner and they've not lost the weight that we need. So it is really important to, again, take their rug off, have a feel of them in those key areas and realise where your horse actually is. So then we come to the, their bucket feed or their hard feed. The key thing here is that although, and again, something I hear all the time, my horse is a good doer, he doesn't need any feed. It is still really important that all horses are fed a balanced diet. It's essential for their overall health, well-being, immunity, coat and skin condition. Grass, forage, and particularly soaked hay will not provide a balanced diet. And when I'm talking about a balanced diet, I'm talking about vitamins, minerals, and quality protein. So lysine is the key amino acid we're thinking about here. They will need to be supplemented. This is why balances have really become very popular now, because they're ideal for good doers. They cut the calories, not the nutrients, and they have a very low feeding rate. So they provide very limited amounts of calories, starch and sugar, per day per serving. So the feeding rate for a 500 kilo horse is 500 grams, 100 grams per 100 kilogram body weight. So a very small feeding rate compared to a compound feed, which may be as much as three kilos for the same horse. Often I'm asked, well, which balancer? Because there are so many out there. And that does depend on your individual situation. Look at your horse's age, look at their workload, 
look at their lifestyle and then look at the functional ingredients within each balancer. The key with balancers is because they all have a low feeding rate, all balancers, stud balancer being the only outlier, all balancers provide very limited amounts of calories, sugar and starch in their daily serving. So which one you choose will really be dependent on what you're looking for for your horse. So as an example, if you have a competition horse who's a good doer, but you're going out competing every weekend, um, your horse is traveling a lot, you need some extra support in terms of digestive support um, and respiratory support and immune support, you might choose the original balancer. If you have a slightly older horse who is active, you want some joint support and you want it all in within your balancer, you might choose a supple and senior balancer. If you have a horse on really restricted rations of forage, so soaked hay, um, restricted grass, the light and lean balancer is perfectly positioned to provide optimal amounts of lysine more than you would find in any other balancers on the market in, in, in that category to ensure they're not deficient in quality protein. Because having a, um, having a deficiency in quality protein in lysine can lead to that horse or pony breaking down lean muscle mass as opposed to fat. So it's really important that we consider this in our weight loss diets. So how can spillers help you? Well, we have our spillers slimmers club. Just as a quick um, interest, um, just perhaps put yes in the in the chat if you are a member of the Spillers Slimmers Facebook group. It'd be interesting to know how many people here tonight were part of Spillers Slimmers. So just perhaps put a quick yes or a wave your hand or or something like that, um, just to give us an idea. Those of you that are oh, brilliant, thank you. This is great. Um, those of you that um, are, you'll know what it is. But those of you who are not, Spillers Slimmers Club. Again, another mouthful. They like to do this to me. Um, is our a Facebook group, which we aim to be a really motivated, motivating and friendly club, providing practical support um, for owners of horses that are overweight or have successfully lost weight, as we're seeing a lot of them um, do nowadays, and to just provide information and advice in a non-judgmental area, including weight loss tips, details of how to body condition score, weight tapes, etc. We obviously post, you know, critical information in there and we have lots of blogs and things like that. But we really feel it's a safe space. <laughs> I can't talk. Safe space for owners to share their successes or challenges um, and help each other out where where they feel they can. Um, so if you're not a member and you do have a, a challenge with a, a good doer, then that's somewhere that you can join um, and, and get some information. So that is it for tonight's webinar. As I say, we will open up the microphones so that people can have ask, ask the questions. If you don't want to come on um, the microphone and ask a question, please pop it in the chat and I will answer it. As a reminder, um, Amper, um, uh, people who registered for Amcha and for your CPD points, you will be receiving a questionnaire um, within the next 24 hours, well, straight away. I'm going to put it in the chat now as well and I have emailed. Perfect. I'm going, to, so you, I'm going to put it in. OK, thank you, Bella. So you do need to answer that within. It's only live for 24 hours. So you do need to answer that straight away um, to be able to get your points. And we will then and you also need to make sure you supply us with your full name and uh, Amtra code for us to be able to process that for you. We do love to hear your feedback on this session. This is the last one of our um, of our winter webinars. So we would really love to know whether people want us to continue with these next winter. We kind of are. I'm hoping that we're going to start all be able to enjoy our horses in the evenings very soon. Hence the reason we only run these um, in the winter. I do. I, I've said that. However, we have got one more lunchtime learning webinar coming up at the end of the month. Um, so look out for that if you are interested in some more information. Um, but we'd love to hear your your feedback. So if you scan that code in, or you've got the link there to our survey, which will also be sent round to you at the end of the um, presentation, um, then you go into our prize draw to win a £20 Spillers voucher. Um, to um, help everybody, I'm going to stop the recording, if I can, because it's much nicer to... Um, sorry, I'm just trying to stop the recording. It's just much nicer to be able to ask the questions without knowing that you're being recorded.
So Would you like me to start reading them out as well? Oh, have I got lots? Yeah. Two seconds, <laughs> let me stop the recording. <laughs>